in verse 18 of chapter 9, the new history of mankind begins. Let's explore this for just a few moments. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9, starting at verse 18. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 9. Not used to these single-digit numbers. <clears throat> starting at verse 18. The sons of Noah who went out from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Ham is the father, uh, father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and the whole earth was populated by them. Now Noah, a farmer, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank so much of the wine that he got drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father shamefully exposed and went out and told his two brothers. And Shem and Yafet took a cloak and put it over their shoulders, and walking backward, they went in and covered their naked father. Their faces were turned away, so they did not see their father lying there shamefully exposed. And when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, he will be servant of servants to his brothers. And then he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of Shem, Canaan will be their servant. May God, may God enlarge Yafet, he will live in the tents of Shem, but Canaan will be their servant. After the flood... Noah lived 350 years. In all, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. Well, just as Adam was the beginning of all mankind on earth, so it is with the new Adam, who was Noah. Now, if it's true that it is patterns that we should look to, to understand God and His ways, then we ought to find an identifiable pattern begun with Adam, from whom all humans would come, which carries over to Noah, Noah, the one from whom all humans would come after the flood. Now, of course, we do find that. And while we all relate the fall of Adam to the fall of man, we seldom remember that Noah also fell, and rather quickly, I should add. I want to just list a handful of the attributes of this God pattern. First of all, Adam was dominant over all creation. Noah was made dominant over the entire purified new world. Second, Adam was blessed by God and instructed to be fruitful and multiply. So was Noah. Third, Adam was placed in a garden, and his job was to till it, that is, care for the garden as the world's first farmer. Noah began as a gardener as well, for he was the first to plant a vineyard as the world's first farmer after the flood, the new world's first farmer, in other words. Fourth, Adam fell by means of eating of the fruit that grew in the garden that he tended. Noah fell by means of eating and then drinking of the fruit in the garden, that grape wine, that he tended. Fifth, Adam's nakedness was uncovered as a result of his sin of eating the fruit. Noah's nakedness was uncovered as a result of his sin of eating, drinking the fruit. Sixth, Adam's sin resulted in a curse being placed onto man. Noah's sin resulted in a curse being placed along the line of Ham, although technically here it was Ham's son, Canaan's line. And seventh, Adam had three sons, one of whom, Shep, was to be the line of righteousness through which the Messiah would come. Noah had three sons, among whom one, Shem was to be the line of righteousness who through, uh, through whom the Messiah would come. So there's a few more parallels, but I think this is enough to illustrate how the patterns that God establishes repeat. And because of these established patterns of God, history itself is cyclical. Well, now we're introduced to the three distinct lines from which every human alive 
today comes, and it's from the three sons of Noah. We're told that these are Ham, Shem, and uh, Japheth, or in Hebrew, Yefet. You, I, we all come from one of these sons of Noah, and likely many of us, most of us, probably have some genes from all three of them in us. Now, notice of the three sons, Ham is spoken of as the father of Canaan. That's a little unusual in the Hebrew format for a father to have his family identity wrapped up in his son. That's always the other way around. Well, we're going to quickly find out why that is. The story is told that begins in verse 20, continues through 27. It's so emotionless, it's told in such a, a matter-of-fact way that it seems almost trifling, unimportant, not just a little bit difficult to understand. In several places in the Old Testament, we run across these odd scenes that seems almost out of place, slightly out of context, perhaps. The problem is not with the verses. It's with our inability to connect them to the matters of the grave importance that they address. So let's examine closely what happens here. This is about Noah planting a vineyard, making wine, and getting drunk. Then crawling inside his tent, falling asleep, naked as a jaybird. Yep, the great godly man Noah got drunk. In this case, wine. By the way, this is the first mention of wine, yain, in the Bible. Now, much argument over these verses has occurred over the centuries, mostly centered on whether or not Noah accidentally created wine and then accidentally drank it and had the world's first hangover. Uh, not much chance. Noah undoubtedly knew the result of fermenting grapes and then drinking it. Noah was just a man. He had flaws, and the beauty of our holy scriptures is that they don't sanitize human beings, make them, make us, perfect and infallible, like all the false religions tend to do with their leaders and founders. Not even the greatest men of the Bible, our Bible heroes, are mentioned, without including some of their fupas and their disagreeable character traits. And the reason for this, very, for this is very straightforward. Our righteousness before God's not dependent on us. It's dependent on God. Always has been. Always will be. But for some reason, Ham enters the tent of Noah and discovers him drunk and naked. And he goes out of the tent and he tells his two brothers, Shem and Yephet. The two brothers then drape a cloak over their shoulders. shoulders. They walk backward and to Noah's tent, and they let the garment fall over their father's nakedness without having looked upon him. When Noah wakes up, he's offended. He's angry. He takes his wrath out, not so much on Ham, but on Ham's son Canaan. He pronounces a curse upon Canaan. Yet, there's more to what's going on here than only a curse on at least one member of Ham's line. There are also some blessings pronounced upon Shem and upon Yefet. Now, before we discuss those blessings, the logical question here is, what was Noah so upset about? Why did his grandson Canaan, who doesn't appear to even have been involved in this event, get the brunt of this curse? Well, ancient sages have come up with all sorts of reasons. Without going into detail, the thought is, that Ham did far more than just to happen in upon his father's nakedness, that Ham committed some type of unnatural act upon his father, Noah, because Ham had become a wicked man. Virtually every competent Bible version uses words in verse 24 that says something like, and when Noah awoke, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. Yet, although I used to think so, I no longer accept that Ham did any more to his father than see him naked, and then run out and report what he saw to his brothers. After a lot of reading of the ancient Hebrew sages, I see that there were likely two crimes committed by Ham. First was the crime of shaming his father. 
it was not simply seeing his father Noah drunk and naked that was the crime. It was what Ham did about it. Rather than show respect by just covering up his father and then leaving without uttering a word, Ham dashed outside and tattled to his brothers. And in doing so, Ham did not honor his father. And what a principles laid down here. Noah deserved to be honored because, first, he was Ham's parent. Second, because God called Noah, of all men on earth, Sadiq, righteous in his sight. If God thought Noah righteous, that's the end of the matter. Ham should have not pointed out his father's sin to his brothers. Now, the second crime that Ham may have committed, and this is my own theory on the matter, is that called Lashon Hara in Hebrew. Lashon Hara means to speak evil of someone, usually in the form of gossip or slander. Now, though it may not sound all that serious, because it's done rather usually in our society. In fact, once we get to Leviticus and begin discussing serat, which is usually mistakenly called leprosy, we're going to see that this disease is thought to be God's punishment and that the crime or the sin associated with contracting serat is almost always the shon hara, speaking evil of someone. Now, Canaan was named as the accursed one, likely because Canaan would have more to do directly with Israel than any other descendant of Ham. But the Bible shows us that in reality, all of, line, all of Ham's line suffered greatly, if we can assume that this is the result of this curse, and not just Canaan. Further, the ancient Hebrew sages and later on rabbis say that one of these Two scenarios is the most likely. First, either our, the text as we have it got corrupted, and the word should have made the accursed one as the father of Canaan. In other words, the phrase, the father of, either got misplaced or just dropped out. Or equally as likely in their eyes, there is more to the story than what was recorded. Perhaps Canaan did play a larger role. I have a third option, and it's this. Since it's not stated which of Ham's sons was his firstborn, it might well have been Canaan. And since the firstborn will carry with him all the father's authority and power, then cursing Canaan is essentially cursing uh, the next head of all of Ham's line. But there's no way to prove this or any other assertion as to why Canaan got cursed for something he seems to be innocent of. But moving on, Noah's other two sons, Shem and Japheth, or Yefet, reacted correctly. They discreetly and honorably covered their father's nakedness, making every effort to give their father utmost respect and thus not bringing shame upon him. Well, here in Genesis 9, Verses 25, 26, and 27, the futures and the destinies of Noah's three sons and the three lines of descent from which every human alive today is attached is set in stone. In other words, what we have contained in these few words is a powerful prophecy for the future of the entire human race. This predictive prophecy of the long-term outcome of a line of people happens from time to time in the Bible. And the pronouncements of Jacob upon Israel, uh, Jacob called Israel upon his three, uh, 12 sons, is very much along the same lines that we see happening here in Gem Genesis chapter 9. But before we ever get there, let me mention that the name Shem means glory, but can also mean just name. Name in the sense of someone making a reputation for himself, a powerful person, perhaps, full of authority. Ham means hot or warm or even burning heat. The name Yefet means enlargement, can also mean beauty. Now, bearing this in mind, let's look at the curses and the blessings that Noah pronounces on his children. He begins, 
Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. Canaan, Ham's son, receives a curse. Or perhaps it was actually Ham who received the curse. What's a curse? It's the opposite of a blessing. A blessing is a beneficial thing. A curse is a judgment. Just as people who were born into the line of blessing, the line of Shem, did nothing to merit their good fortune, so it is with the people who were born into the line of the curse, the line of Ham. They did nothing to merit their misfortune. The people that come from Ham's son, primarily Canaan, became the races that occupied Africa, who have for centuries suffered the fate of subjugation, more often than not poverty. For some unknown reason, Africa has just not thrived as much as the rest of the world. Now, there's much more to this lack of thriving than just a lack of personal freedom, even a lack of natural resources. But the idea is the descendants of Canaan are going to wind up, for some reason, being subject to the descendants of Shem and Yafet. Now, we have to take note that if we look at all of Ham's descendants, often they represent enemies of Israel at one point or another in history. So we're going to find Israel either conquering or being conquered by some of the descendants of Ham. The people of Egypt come from Ham, from his son Mitzrayim. And interestingly, so do the Philistines come from Ham. Now, blessed be Adonai, the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be their slave. Here we have more proof that something went wrong with Ham and with his children, and doubly so for Canaan's descendants. Because it indicates that while Shem will follow the God of Israel, many of Ham's descendants will choose another direction. But what we all have here is also indicating that Shem's ancestors will carry the authority forward for Noah's family, which basically means all mankind. I want to say that again. The rulership of mankind is within the line of Shem because it was handed over to him by Noah in this blessing that we're examining. Noah had every right to do that. Just as Adam was preeminent over all other men for a long time, so Noah was in essence the king of the world immediately following the great flood. He was the head of the only family that existed on planet Earth. His authority was absolute over all humanity, even if the sum total of humanity was about eight. And Noah chose to pass along that power to Shem. And we see that this is so because God, the only God, is called what? Shem's God. Indicating a linkage, an allegiance, a relationship between Shem and Yahweh. And this relationship with God is not associated with that either Yafet or Ham. The line of Shem would go on to become Hebrews, Arabs, and some of the Orientals. Next, may God enlarge Yafet, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Okay, this blessing bestowed upon Yafet was somewhat dependent on his relationship with Shem. The descendants of Yafet, Japheth, would benefit when they were in good relations with Shem, which is the meaning of shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Yafet was the branch of the family which would enlarge, that is, they grow greatest in population and in wealth. Yafet is the ancestor of the Romans and the Greeks and most of the European peoples, who themselves are ancestors of the earliest American colonists. And no time, at, at, at no time in history has such wealth and fruitfulness been seen as what happened first in Rome, then in Europe, then in America. And by all appearances, it had not to do with luck, but rather with the blessing of Noah upon his son, Yafet. And, again, 
the descendants of Canaan, but in reality, Ham, were to be subject to Yefet's offspring just as they would be subject to Shem's offspring. Now, once more, in the last couple of chapters of Genesis, this exact pattern of blessing and cursing and bestowing them upon a son who represents an entire branch of the family gets repeated. And it concerns the blessing that a dying Jacob, Israel, pronounced on his 12 male children, the 12 tribes of Israel. In a few months, when we get there, we're going to look extensively at this blessing because it's every bit as monumental as Noah's blessing upon his three sons. I want to give you just a slight preview of that so that you can see the important relationship between the blessing of Noah and then hundreds of years later, the blessing of Jacob. Pretty soon now in Genesis, we're going to be introduced to the formalized concept of the firstborn, or better, the firstborn blessing. In essence, the firstborn blessing ceremony is like the reading of the family will at the death of the father. Only the firstborn blessing took place before the death of the father because it was to be pronounced by the father upon his son. The father at some point, usually later in his life, would decide it was time for him to tell his boys who was to receive what upon the father's eventual death. And by tradition, it was the first male child born to a man, the firstborn, who received the bulk of everything the father owned, plus that son would now be the head of the family, the ruler of that family or tribe that formerly had been run by his father. The firstborn was never a female. So the firstborn blessing consisted of two major components. First, the passing forward of the right to the entire family's authority and power. Second, the passing forward of what came eventually to be called the double portion of the family's wealth. In theory, the double portion meant that the firstborn son got double the amount given to any other son. So, for instance, if a man had four sons, he'd divide all he had into five parts. Give the firstborn son two of those five, the remaining sons then each got one part. It wasn't always that neat and clean because it wasn't necessarily the giving of exactly double. That wasn't the goal. It could have been almost everything. It could have been eh, just a tad more than the other sons. The father had a lot of latitude in his decision. I want you to stay with me because understanding the firstborn blessing is most helpful in understanding Scripture. So the firstborn son, by tradition, he gets all the power and the bulk of the family's wealth. His siblings are now under that firstborn's authority. In other words, their brother. And what we saw in Noah's blessing was a type of firstborn blessing before it became formalized and was given a name. Of Noah's three sons, though, two got blessings, one got a curse. Now, what's interesting is that in the typical firstborn blessing, the transfer of family authority and family fruitfulness, wealth, goes to the same son. It just goes together. It's a package. But in Noah's firstborn blessing, the blessing got split. Shem received the authority. Yefet, the fruitfulness, the wealth. The biblical term is enlargement. It's very strange. Now, fast forward several hundred years. Jacob, called Israel, is now living in, Israel, in, in Egypt. He calls his 12 sons to him because he's on his deathbed. He knows his time is nearing, so he performs the all-important firstborn blessing. We find this, by the way, in Genesis 49. And due to the indiscretions of the first three of his sons, Jacob winds up declaring his fourth son, Judah, as that firstborn. Actually, doing that isn't all that strange. It happened with some frequency that the real firstborn was passed over for a younger son who, for whatever reason, 
had won favor with his father or equally as likely had fallen out of favor for something that his father didn't like. The real strangeness is Jacob goes against all custom and tradition and he splits the firstborn blessing just like Noah did. He gives the family's power and authority to Judah, but he gives the double portion, the family's wealth, enlargement, expressed as the blessing of enlargement and fruit fruitfulness, he gives this to Joseph. Now, this is highly unusual, but it's exactly the same thing Noah did all those centuries earlier. The impact of what Noah did merely set the destinies of the peoples and nations of the world until history ends, that's all. The impact of what Jacob did set the stage for the emergence of the Messiah who would redeem mankind and put it into history as we know it. And he would do that through Judah's offspring and the taking, and and the taking of the fruitfulness of the gospel to the whole world through, J through Joseph's family. Now, we're going to spend quite some time on that subject when we get there because it's really vital. Now, here's the thing to keep at the forefront of your minds as we go forward. The accursed Canaan son of Ham is the founder and the namesake of the land of Canaan. The land that God told Moses and then Joshua to take away from its inhabitants who were the descendants of Canaan because these people were so wicked in God's eyes. The land that God set aside for his chosen people, Israel, as they came up out of Egypt, was what Canaan and his descendants had, were currently occupying. The Canaanites, Ham's descendants, would eventually bow down to the Israelites, Shem's descendants. And Noah's prophetic blessing set all this into motion and will culminate when Messiah comes in the near future. Chapter 9 ends by informing us that Noah lived for another 350 years after the great flood, dying at the ripe old age of 950. Well, let's move on to Genesis chapter 10. But before we read the chapter, I want to set the stage for it. Um, it's quite common in teaching the Bible to go around Genesis chapter 10. Typically, the reason is that the content is seen as about as interesting as reading a dictionary. A dictionary full of difficult names that seems to have little bearing on much of anything except the Bible academics. Well, we're going to read chapter 10. We're going to chew on it for a while. And the reason is that here we will see what is often referred to as the table of nations. I do think it's important to know which nations come from which of the sons of Noah. And one of the reasons that's important is because of the blessings and the curses and therefore the destinies that God decided would follow each of these family lines. You see, we are all tied to these destinies one way or another, like it or not. We're all tied to Noah's sons. So when you find yourself in one of these three lines of humans, don't scream at me. Complain to God. These blessings and curses and destinies have not ended and they have not changed. Rather, their true fulfillment is continuing to play out even in our time. And it's going to continue right until Christ is back on his throne on earth where he belongs as far as I'm concerned. Now, to God, family lines are always key. We've already seen this constant pattern of God dividing, selecting, electing. This was a major part of what occurred in Noah's blessing of his three sons with the blessings that created division. We saw this principle established early on when God divided light from dark, good from evil, we saw it when he divided mankind into male and female. We saw it when Seth became the line of good, Cain the line of evil. Now we see it with Shem 
becoming the line of those who followed God, Ham becoming the line of those who wandered away from God, and Yafet the line of fruitfulness and increase. And if we were to follow this theme all the way to the New Testament, we find that Christ is that seed of the woman who had come back from a, who had come from a specific family line divided off from all other family lines. And that line, of course, traces back to Shem. Now let us remember that these lines of good and uh, of good are the paths that the eventual seed of the woman, the woman being Hava, Eve, would eventually come. Knowing these details about family lines is, is really important to understanding not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. So, let's read Genesis chapter 10. Open your Bibles to page 9. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, there we'll find Genesis chapter 10. Here is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Yafet were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yavan, Yuval, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Rifat, and Togarmah. The sons of Yavan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim. And from these, the islands of the nations were divided into their lands, each according to its language, according to their families in their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Sheva, Havla, Savta, Rama, and Saftakha. The sons of Rama were Shiva and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod, who was the first powerful ruler on earth. He was a mighty hunter before Adonai. This is why people say, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Adonai. His kingdom began with Babel, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalnei in the land of Shinar. Asher went out from that land and built Nineveh, the city Rechovot, uh, Kelach, and Resen between Nineveh and Kelach. That one is the great city. Mitzrayim fathered the Ludim, the Anamim, the Lahavim, the Naphtuchim, the Patruzim, the Kazluchim, from whom came the Philistines, and the Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, Het, the Yavusi, the Amorite, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Samarites, and the Hamatites. And afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. The border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go towards Gerar, to Aza, meaning Gaza. As you go towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zvoim to Lesha. These were the descendants of Ham according to their families and their languages and their lands and in their nations. Children were also born to Shem, ancestor of all the descendants of Ever and older brother of Yafet. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arkpakshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uts, Hul, Geter, and Mash. Arkpachad fathered Shelach. Shelach fathered Ever. To Ever were born two sons. One was given the name Peleg because during his lifetime the earth was divided. His brother's name was Yoktan. Yoktan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Hatsar Mavet, Yerach, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Oval, Avamiel, Sheva, Ophir, Havla, and Yovav. All these were the sons of Yoktan. Their Torah stretched from Mesha as you go towards far to the mountain in the east. These were the descendants of Shem according to their families and languages in their lands and in their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations. From these, the nations of the earth were divided up after the flood. It 
since Noah's three sons have populated the present entire world, it's only fitting that we would know something of those who came from each line. Now, interestingly, although academics tend to scoff at the Bible, they grudgingly admit that the 10th chapter of Genesis is the most accurate and complete document of its kind pertaining to the historical origination of nations and races. It would not be inaccurate to say that, generally speaking, Shem populated Asia, Ham populated Africa, and Yafet populated Europe. And of course, there's exceptions, there's ongoing migration, there's a lot of intermixing among the three lines coming from Noah that took place over the centuries, so it's less cut and dry today as it was 3,000 years ago and more. And as we look at this map, many of the names I've just read to you start to appear. And without touching on them all, we find, for instance, that the descendants of Yafet became the Simri from Gomer, who were the first to settle in the area of Wales and Brittany. The Scythians from Magog, who formed the Russian people. The Medes from Madai. The Greeks from Yavan. The Thracians from Tiras, who became the Macedonians, from whom eventually came the world-conquering Alexander the Great. From these groups of people came the Germans, the Celts, uh, rather the Celts and the uh, Armenians. We should also take notice that in the line of Yafet was Tarshish. This is primarily modern day Spain. Some of you prophecy buffs might recognize the name Tarshish because it's mentioned in Isaiah. I want to take just a few minutes and examine a prophecy that's 2,700 years old, but whose fulfillment has only begun in our lifetimes. And it's continuing as we speak. And this is from Isaiah chapter 60. And we're only going to read verses 1 through 12 for right now. Open your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 60. If you have a complete Jew Jewish Bible, it is page 531. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise and shine, Yerushalayim, for your light has come. The glory of Adonai has arisen over you. For although darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples, on you Adonai will rise. Over you will be seen his glory. Nations will go towards your light and kings towards your shining splendor. Raise your eyes and look around. They're all assembling and coming to you. Your sons are coming from far off. Your daughters carried on their nurses' hips. Then you will see and be radiant. Your heart will throb, swell and with delight. For the riches of the seas will be brought to you. The wealth of nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah. All of them coming from Sheba. Sheba bringing gold and frankincense, proclaiming the praises of Adonai. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered for you. The rams of Naviot will be at your service. They will come up and be received on my altar as I glorify my glorious house. Who are these? Flying along like clouds, like doves to their dovecotes. The coastlands are putting their hope in me with the Tarshish ships in the lead to bring your children from far away, and with them their silver and gold, for the sake of Adonai your God, the Holy One of Israel who glorifies you. Foreigners will rebuild your walls. The kings will be at your service. For in my anger I struck you, but in my mercy I pity you. Your gates will always be open. They will not be shut by day or by night so that people can bring you the wealth of nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation or the kingdom that won't serve you will perish. Yes, those nations will be utterly destroyed. Now, if you don't have a chill running down your spine when you 
just heard that, just read it, then I think you completely missed what I just read to you. Our generation is in the midst of this very event. This is about the Jews returning to Israel. But even more, it's about all Israelites returning to Israel. We'll, we'll get into this more fully in the months ahead. But for now, just know that Jews only represent two of the 12 tribes of Israel. There are other Israelite tribes in existence in Asia who will be returning to the land very soon. How do I know this? Not only is this not only is it in this prophecy in Isaiah, it's even more specifically, with more detail, spoken of in Ezekiel 37. And the Israeli government officially acknowledged for the first time in March of 2005 that there have been found members of what had been termed the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, and they are indeed Israelites, but they're not Jews. That may be a little bit murky for you right now, but we'll, later on it won't be. Now, I've often heard Bible teachers and pastors speak of how ships will come from Tarshish to bring the Jews back home to Israel in the last days. But the Tarshish wasn't really literal, just a word symbolic of faraway places. They must have been among the many who skipped over Genesis chapter 10. Because we certainly see there, and then here in... Isaiah 60, it's backed up. We see who Tarshish is. He is the son of Gomer, who is the son of Japheth, Japheth. Not only that, but one of the largest Jewish sects in existence is called Sephardic Jews. Sephardic Jews are Jews who come primarily, not entirely, but mostly, from a large group of Hebrews who settled in Spain during the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries. Many Sephardic Jews led the way back to the Holy Land late in the 19th century, then again after World Wars I and II. Spain equals Sephardic. Tarshish is a city in Spain. This is neither speculation or allegory. It's just historical fact. And we'll continue with this next week. Would you please rise?